Welcome to the creators here at Some City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators. Making videos by making creators. Art, making what you make. Today, the second of our first two episodes, our hosts, Tom Jackson and me, Will Rogers, talk about what it means to be creators, background, and why this show. So subscribe to our channel, comment, and most importantly, watch Building With Us as we build community with you. Hey, welcome to the creators back again here at Some City for another edition and uh, special guest and uh, host as well, Tom Jackson. How you doing, Tom? I'm doing great, and it's great to be here. Thank you for uh, having me here, Bill. So here's the uh, pressing question. Mm -hmm. Are you a creator? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, are you are you ever intimidated? I mean, some some people are uh, sometimes when you know people say, "Are you are you an artist? Do you consider yourself an artist, uh, creator?" Some people take the same way. I, I like. Uh, both terms, whether I am sure. one or aren't one, but certainly the creator term. I like being a creator. I like making stuff. Do you consider yourself a creator? I, I consider absolutely. yourself a creator. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, definitely a creator. And, you know, the, the terms sometimes uh, come and go. For example, you know, storyteller. I mean, that was a term that I think a lot of film and video producers uh used for quite a while and, so, and still use uh, because that's also applicable. Um, and so creator, absolutely. And uh, your point about the artistic aspect of, uh, uh, you know, film and video production is well taken. And I think for me, uh, after I took some classes at Boston Film and Video Foundation in the late mm. 90s and then place. set in uh, to, to start working on what became Greetings from Missile Street uh, about the Iraq sanctions, um, I kind of went into producing that particular guerrilla uh, video in a, with a sort of an idea that, you know, it's a kind of newsy topic and that it, it may or may not have been something that would have some room for artistic uh, and more creative, you know, shots and uh, uh, editing and things like that. And in fact, you know, that's where I fully realize that, that there is room for being a creator uh, beyond just the technical aspect of, of putting a documentary together. And so, so. so uh, you know, a, a new term, uh, creator, um, but a uh, and, and something that's been taken up by uh, folks who specifically uh, use YouTube, um, right? And YouTube itself has a part of their site dedicated to creators. So it's a uh, it's a a, tomb, a a a term with some some street cred, and uh, I think a lot of people. Casey Neistat comes to mind. Um, Roman Atwood, uh, Hank and John Green, all people who I uh, have enjoyed following, uh, Phil DeFranco, and people who, you know, just grabbed the camera and started shooting stuff in a, think of the Hank and John Green, the Vlog Brothers, sending messages to one another. Great, great concept of a way to just get these, uh, these messages of them talking to each other, but... Uh, yeah. Certainly, I see you as a creator. Well, it's and I definitely can feel the the sort of pull of being drawn in that direction. I mean, I've I've thought about things like vlogs for years now, and remember even going back to before I left my uh, day job at this high tech firm in Massachusetts. Um, after taking those classes at Boston Film and Video Foundation. Uh, talking to co-workers about you know how we were heading into this age when we were going to be able to shoot digital video out in the field uh, download it onto our laptops and upload it onto you know some sort of website and this is, this was pre-youtube um, 
and that that was going to become a, a real thing. And, you know, I mean, it, it took a little bit, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, part of it was getting the fast enough uh, uh, pipe, as they call it, fast enough uh, connection to really uh, to make that happen. Even with compressed video, it's still, you know, once upon a time with slower speeds, it took a little longer to, to upload it. But um, So you, you mentioned... Um a film you worked on, which is actually the first film. Uh, it's when I we we got to meet each other because right. I had heard about uh, your your uh, documentary "Greetings from Missile Street," and uh, it was a NPR report actually talking about. Uh, I'm not sure if I talking about your experience creating that film and the. Uh, so just tell me yeah. what's what's the story there and and why make. Why'd you begin making films? Why'd you begin making that film? Um, well, why did I begin uh, the? There's kind of probably two different answers for the for that. Why did I begin to try to do that? Um, I mean, I, I had always been pretty fascinated by like film and TV. Although I was never, even when I was a kid, I wasn't like a the sort of consummate uh, TV junkie. There were a couple of shows that I you know, watched regularly, uh, Kung Fu and Beretta and shows like that, you know, when I was in junior high school. Um, but really the first, the first movies to come along that, that really kind of lit up my interest and, and excitement about the idea of trying to do something like that were a couple of Martin Scorsese films that came out in the, in the seventies. And, uh, uh, late 70s and then into the early 80s. Uh, so Taxi Driver and uh, Raging Bull. You know, I saw both of those in the theater when I was a kid and, you know, was just amazed. I mean, Raging Bull probably even more so um, just because of the realism of the boxing scenes. But not only that. I mean, that was kind of a well, fairly well-publicized uh, thing that, that Scorsese and his team did in that film. And I remember there was quite a bit in the in the media uh, about uh, uh, shooting those those scenes where uh, De Niro is is boxing and uh, and the realism that they managed to get. But just the the realism of of the dialogue and uh, the interactions between the people uh, outside of the boxing ring um, was was what really kind of struck me the most. And I started to think about, you know, how how can that realism uh, actually come to life if I was ever to try to, to make a film? That was still a long ways in the, in the future uh, for me to really give it a first try. Um, but uh, at some point, you know, uh, between then and, and starting to make readings from, from Missile Street, I saw a few other films that really inspired me. And so one of them was... Uh, uh, in 1992, when the film Titicut Follies by mm. Frederick Weissman mm -hmm. was uh, unbanned <laughs> from being shown in Massachusetts, uh, I saw it. And so, uh, why you uh, Titicut Follies to give us a yeah us Titicut a fun Follies sketch. is a, a cinema verite style documentary um, by Frederick Weissman, who's still making films and still down there in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, but it focuses on uh, an inside look that he managed to get on the Bridgewater uh, State Institution for the Criminally Insane. And he manages to expose a lot of the abuses and so on that were going on <clears throat> inside the walls of that institution. Um, and I, you know, just there's so many powerful images and moments in that. And realizing that this, you know, this is a film that was made for kind of the, the, the least of these uh, people, you know, forgotten people who are just kind of cast into this institution and, you know, don't have family or, or friends coming to visit them and, and that sort of thing. And seeing the abuses that were going on, uh, which uh, Weissman managed to capture some, some of uh, on film. And while I was, you know, obviously aghast at what was happening or what had been happening in 1967 when he made the film. The other really big impression that I came away from from seeing that was 
I want to do things like that. I, I want to, um, you know, use a camera and microphone to try to expose some things that I think are either not getting any attention in the mainstream media or they're maybe they're getting attention, but not on a particular angle or part of the story. Um, and so a number of years later, when I, you know, after I had had some, uh, some schooling at uh, uh, Boston Film and Video Foundation, I uh, decided that I was going to take a first hack at, uh, at actually making a video. I, I had no money, you know. I mean, this was pretty much uh, a no budget, not completely no budget, but very, very low budget uh, uh, effort and, you know, took minimal gear uh, to Iraq with me. Um, but I had learned about the effects of the economic sanctions, which our country was a leader in, uh, <clears throat> on Iraq, and the effect that that was having on civilians, particularly on small children. Uh, this is famous quote that uh, Madeleine Albright uh, used in a, in a news broadcast in which she was asked about, uh, I think it was Leslie Stahl uh, asks her, you know, we've heard that uh, half a million children have died over and above the, the normal rate of, of children dying in Iraq. Uh, and Leslie Stahl asked Mel Madeleine Albright if uh, the price is worth it. And you know, Madeleine Albright issues her statement that, uh, you know, it's a tough decision, but we think the price is worth it. Uh, just preposterous uh, example of economic warfare. Um, again, in, in my mind, having this catastrophic effect on the least of these, the, the little people, you know, not Saddam Hussein and his regime, they, they were uh, relatively, and this, this was publicized, they were relatively, you know, unscathed. I mean, certainly it wasn't helpful to them that these economic sanctions were taking place, but it was the civilian population that was paying the price. Uh, and so I decided that was, that was going to be my first attempt at making a documentary and exposing a, a part of a story that simply wasn't being addressed in the mainstream media. And what was your, uh, what was your process uh, for creating that? So did you uh, buy a ticket and, and uh, just go over there? <laughs> did you research? Did you... Yeah. Uh, oh, a lot of research. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I went into it having a really extensive knowledge of uh, what was going on, what had been going on, uh, you know, the, the, what the sanctions were all about and, uh, uh, and why. And while I agreed on one hand that uh, uh, some sort of repercussions on a leader who had, you know, gassed uh, some of uh, his own people uh, and things like that, uh, of course, uh, that kind of thing should be addressed uh, and someone like that should be brought to justice. But the way that the international community led by the USA uh, was going about it, like I said before, it simply wasn't having uh, an effect on Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Uh, so with, yeah. with that knowledge, I, I, you know, basically what I, what I did was I took the first um, consumer grade digital video camera which was called a Sony PC-100 uh, and uh, not particularly well named uh, because I used to get this question all the time. It's, you know, if I told somebody it was a PC-100, they'd say, well, is it a computer? Well, mm, kind of, I guess, a, a little bit. Um, but uh, the PC-100 and, you know, shotgun mic, lav, uh, a couple of other little pieces of gear and took that over there. Um, you know, I felt as though I knew more than enough about the subject uh, to uh, to be able to kind of um, think like an editor editor when shooting and uh, and write some sort of uh, you know narration around it uh, that would help to tell the story. Um, so you know, that's that's what I did. And uh, how long did you uh, did you spend over there shooting? A uh, total of about eight weeks. Wow. In, in the year 2000 mm -hmm. um, and you know even in the the hottest parts of the summer uh, in the city of Basra Iraq which uh, you know by the way for anybody who thinks that all all of the Middle East is uh, just a dry heat that's not as bad as it sounds 
uh, not true. It's as bad <laughs> as it sounds. It's worse than it sounds. Yeah. Uh, you know, a city like Basra, which is right on the Persian Gulf, uh, it was actually quite humid quite often. I mean, I don't think it rained more than five minutes one day uh, the whole time that I was there, but uh, uh, it, uh, it was just oppressively hot. Um, and so, I, so, yeah. so I, we came back and uh, 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 went out to Chicago, which was uh, where this um, organization called Voices in the Wilderness, at the time it was called Voices in the Wilderness, uh, which was a campaign to stop the economic sanctions uh, on Iraq, uh, was located. Um, and I managed to hook up uh, with an editor out there and a studio. Um, and uh, the editor's name is uh, Jan Muller. He's still an editor. Uh, he's edited for uh, ABC News Chicago for years. Uh, edited uh, Mr. Ebert's show uh, while he was still alive uh, for several years. Uh, and the studio is uh, also still there. Uh, it's called Media, Pro Media Process Group, uh, led by a guy named Bob Hercules. And Bob was very generous and accommodating. Uh, I think he liked the, uh, the subject matter and, uh, and got behind us uh, in, a, in a pretty big way. And uh, also gave a fair amount of, uh, of like stock footage or you know, shots from Iraq because he had access to them. He had been one of the founding people uh, involved in Free Speech TV, uh, which also eventually aired uh, uh, Missile Street a number of times. Mm -hmm. uh, and how did, it, uh, how did, how did the, uh, the finished product uh, come together and how did you start getting it out to folks? How did you start distributing it? That was, you know, that was an interesting process and kind of, kind of arduous, uh, but eventually you know, we managed to, or I managed to write a, a narration that was uh, good enough to kind of hold it all together and, and actually tell a story. Um, and, uh, you know, Jan Muller and, and also Bob Hercules, you know, kind of lent their eyes to it as well, uh, which was very helpful. And it took a number of, several months, I don't remember exactly how long, but uh, I, I do remember Jan kind of patting me on the back at the end of it and saying, congratulations, you know, you've, you've finished uh, uh, your first documentary. And, uh, and it, in that moment, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, great, yeah. And he was like, no, no, you don't understand. I mean, for, for every documentary that gets completed and actually gets released out there, at whatever level it gets released, there are hundreds, if not thousands of incomplete productions that never see the light of day or the darkness of a movie theater um, in, in all kinds of various different stages of, of production uh, and or post-production. And so it's no small thing to, to have finished that, that first one. And, uh, you know, I've always remembered that and always appreciated that he, uh, he kind of uh, threw that in there at the end. Uh, you know, some kind of encouraging words. And so from there, I, I wanted to do more. But in terms of what happened with, uh, with that particular documentary, um, Free Speech TV aired it, I, I don't even know how many times. You know, those, that was the relatively early days of the satellite networks, which Free Speech TV is still on. Um, but they put it into their rotation, and so many, many times they aired it. Um, and... Uh, it got into something like 15 film festivals worldwide um, and a lot of grassroots use. Interestingly enough, I mean, and this is in the days really before social media. So there was a lot of, particularly by way of voices in the, world, in the wilderness making contacts, but it got a lot of grassroots use in screenings and talks about the issue not only across the USA, but uh, around Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, England, because Voices had an, a, another office over in England, and contacts in all those other uh, countries, and you know, which was really gratifying, you know, to know that it was getting out there in various capacities to a lot of people. And something in approaching the project was that uh, something that you were, you know, consciously looking for, uh, looking for. Uh, people to really use the film? Absolutely, yeah. It, it was, uh, 
you know, sort of uh, uh, activist um, civilian media or whatever you want to whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it, it definitely did have a uh, uh, an aim to it in terms of trying to a educate more people about the 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 issue because as I said it wasn't really being covered uh, in mainstream media and then to try to do something you know about it uh, you know contact their their Congress people or whatever they could do to help raise the voices of these really literally voiceless or almost literally voiceless people uh, in Iraq that uh, were suffering and and being ignored by you know, not only their own leadership, but uh, uh, the rest of the world as well. Now, uh, my own narrative, you know, uh, you uh, actually were in an office space right across the hall and um, was out of balance uh, Mm -hmm. the next project? Were there some things between it? There was a couple of things in between it and, you know, kind of playing at the same level in terms of uh, lack of funding. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which is, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it was, they were very much guerrilla level productions, mostly solo, although, you know, we got a little bit of help with uh, editing on a couple of them. Uh, but uh, there was one called, um, uh, wow, am I remembering the titles here? <laughs> there was one, one called Defending the Commons, which uh, took me to Nicaragua where there were, um, there was a small group of people who were protesting the uh, the idea that their government was considering privatizing their water supply uh, and basically selling it to huge companies like Nestle and Coca-Cola mm-hmm. uh, to extract and bottle and uh, sell to you know people who had money in other parts of the world. Yeah, I remember <clears> that <throat> conver- those conversations. Yeah, and uh, you know the the great thing about that particular uh, making that video was not only going to Nicaragua for the first time in, in my life, and this was in like 2003, so it was long after the you know the time period when Nicaragua had been in the the mainstream news here because of you know the Reagan administration mining the harbors uh, of Nicaragua and things like that. Um, but I I also enjoyed you know some of the people who I got to interview. Uh, in addition to the the folks down there in Nicaragua. So I I had the opportunity to interview Vandana Shiva, who is an absolutely brilliant uh, voice, a passionate voice about water issues and other issues related to uh, uh, big companies going around the world and uh, and basically, you know, buying up resources or taking them or whatever, you know, whatever it takes for them to get what they want. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, uh, you know... uh, so that's that's a part of what kept me going with this kind of thing is having the opportunity to uh, sit and talk with and uh, and ask questions of uh, brilliant voices like like Vandana Shiva's. Um, the next guerrilla level thing that I did was called Worlds Apart, and it focused on uh, <clears throat> mostly on the uh, a young woman who was an EMT. In New York City on 9/11, and uh, uh, who uh, had you know worked on on 9/11, trying to save lives or, or anything that they could do under those circumstances. And then afterwards, she formed this uh, very loosely based uh, group uh, that was called uh, Ground Zero for Peace. And it was other rescue workers who had. Uh, uh, instead of reacting in a way of wanting to immediately, you know, go to war uh, and start bombing different people in different places, uh, they wanted to, they wanted our government to look into, you know, nonviolent conflict resolution means. And uh, so as you can imagine, you know, they were met with a lot of uh, negativity from different, including some of their colleagues um, but uh, I thought that you know Megan Bartlett, who was the uh, the founder of the group, uh, was another brilliant voice that I, I really wanted to try to help find a way to, to put out there. And of course, 
again, this was, I was making, shooting this in like 2004 and editing it in 2005. And it was before, um, you know, or maybe right about that time when things started to, to turn a little bit on the George W. Bush, Dick Cheney uh, administration. You know, because of course, at first they, they had huge popularity after 9 11 and lots and lots of support, public support. Um, <clears throat> but as people started to really think about, you know, what had gone on uh, post 9 11 and the, the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan dragged on, and, and same with Iraq, uh, and it started to become more apparent that the, the whole uh, story behind their reasons for invading and occupying Iraq were based on lies and exaggerations and things like that. Uh, some of which uh, were in Greetings from Missile Street <laughs> had been exposed in that in that uh, video. Um, but as that became more apparent, it, it was fairly obvious that uh, uh, the the tide kind of turned on you know the popularity of that administration. And uh, and and thinking <clears throat> about that uh, that kind of climate shift, that uh, popular shift, thinking of the, uh, the work that I know we had spoken about, filmmaker Robert Greenwald, and thinking mm -hmm. about his distribution method, uh, not necessarily using small cameras like you were using, but, uh, but certainly his, his methodology was, let's get this out really quickly, and he put out a film on Walmart. He very much got into the, uh, the, the cost of the sanctions on the uh, the other big operation in Iraq, right? And but his method for distributing work was similar to what you were doing with Missile Street in terms of not trying to. Uh, a traditional notion is you get your work on television and try to get some theatrical attention yeah. to your work. But this, uh, but he started doing screening groups and. Uh, I think it was ten dollars a person. Let's get let's get a hundred thousand people to put in ten dollars a person to reach where we want to be for funding or whatever it might have been. I don't remember the exact numbers, but the idea of very inexpensive compared to how films were looked at before that. And that uh, I remember having those conversations with you and Peter Vandemark also, who was uh, shared that office space that I was in. Yeah, and. I remember a conversation uh, about another project that you were really interested in, and why don't you why don't you pick up on that? Sure. Well, um, you know, I just first want to kind of throw in a, another thing with Greenwald was uh, uh, his outfoxed, which uh, oh right you know, right was a right critique yeah. of, uh, of of Fox News Network and. Mm -hmm. uh, um, also, you know, I, I watch that now. I actually show in a class that I have uh, at UNH, and um, I'm I'm kind of taken aback a little bit sometimes because it's it's pretty rough. I mean, it's not like super polished or anything. Technically uh, rough, right? Rough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but aesthetically right, rough. That, that aesthetically rough. That doesn't take anything away from the power of the story or how well uh, he and his team managed to tell that story. Um, but uh, you know, it's. Probably that one was uh, relatively low budget, and you're right. After that, he started to find some really interesting ways of uh, of fundraising. Um, but it was actually his Walmart film that that kind of got the wheels rolling. Between that and a, uh, a, a summer uh, summer stay that I had uh, down in Massachusetts at, at this uh, community called Agape, uh, which is sort of like a uh, quasi Catholic worker type community uh, where they have a focus on environmental issues. Um, I came away from that really having been convinced. So this was the summer of 2005. Really more convinced than I had ever been before about the reality of of climate change that was happening and the fact that it was uh, anthropogenic or you know caused by human activity. Um, and at that point, then along comes the Walmart film later on in 2005. The high, the high cost of low prices. Right. And that, that was another, another Greenwald uh, hit back last decade. And, you know, when I saw that, I, I thought, well, that, I think it's great that somebody did uh, a sort of expose on Walmart and uh, the, the harm that they've uh, caused in different ways. Um, 
But if I was going to make a, a documentary about a, a large corporation, it would be about Exxon Mobil. And the Why's reason that? for that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Why is that? That's the key question. So, yeah, uh, I mean, the reason for that was uh, I had been keeping an eye on Exxon, eventually Exxon Mobil, for years, really since the uh, the outset of the uh, Exxon Valdez oil spill up in Alaska, and which was which was huge, and oh, yeah. uh, it was. Was was it the largest uh, spill in history, or there? Uh, I think at the time, mm -hmm. yeah, and and caused a huge amount of damage because it was you know relatively close to to land, and you know, so many of the fishermen of different types uh, in that region were adversely affected by it, and uh, you know so and, and Exxon's response at the time had kind of more to do with uh, promotional activity than, than actual, you know, cleanup activity, which was later proved uh, to be the case. And they did things like, you know, uh, not paying the, uh, the fishermen the, the damages that they owed them for years. It took decades before they actually paid up. Um, yeah, you can think of the people whose livelihood had been uh, totally, totally lost and... Right. 20 years to uh, once once the courts agreed that there should be some re recompense for uh, for them. Yeah. Uh, 20 years before they actually received any funds. Yeah. And of course, uh, as you remember, um, having worked uh, along with me and Peter Vandermark on that uh, film, Out of Balance, um, you know, we, we mentioned that. We mentioned that a number of, uh, and this was in 2006 when we were doing production and post-production. At that point, uh, something like 3,000 fishermen had died or, or you know, before getting a, a penny. Mm. Uh, you know, just tragic. And But then as we kind of transitioned in that film from, from that particular story in, into the narration, we put that, that idea that, in a way, Exxon's response to that that accident and the environmental damage that was caused by it um, was somewhat of a, a dress rehearsal, uh, taking nothing away from the the damages and so on, uh, but comparing it to what you know the way Exxon eventually Exxon Mobil uh, responded to the issue of climate change, um, and so. You know, it's, that is still the only documentary expose on ExxonMobil uh, out there. and uh, Available on Netflix. Out of balance. Still available on Netflix in disc. Uh, mm -hmm. I wish that they would put it out there to stream, but they haven't done that yet. Um, Call your friends at Netflix and say, on demand. Yeah, really. That's, that would be great if people would, uh, would get behind that because uh, you know, maybe then they'd, they'd actually think about it. Um, but it, that... That documentary, you know, got even more exposure than Missile Street. Um, managed to get on to uh, Link TV, which showed it a number of times, including like during their fun drive every year. They had a, a special uh, airing it uh, with uh, Van Jones doing uh, some commentary hmm. with the uh, announcer that they kept cutting back to, you know, to, uh, to ask, you know, for viewers to send some money in. Um, and Telesur, which is uh, a network that's seen throughout the Spanish-speaking world, uh, aired it. And I'm not really sure how many times they aired it, but uh, uh, at least once. And a whole bunch of film festivals you know, won some awards. And again, a lot of grassroots usage. Um, so. and what were your goals with, with uh, Out of Balance? Out of Balance, you know, I wanted... There was a couple of things, you know, I, I wanted to show how out of balance the power of gigantic corporations like ExxonMobil had become. Because, uh, as you remember, we get into some of the, uh, the political things that went on around the issue of climate change uh, that ExxonMobil had an obvious interest in and some sort of uh, influence on in some way. Um, and I also wanted to show that uh, they were instrumental in spearheading the funding of the uh, so-called skeptics of climate change, now more commonly referred to as deniers of climate change. 
uh, who were getting into the media and you know getting on not only the, the more conservative networks like Fox News, but uh, for many years there, all across the board, you know, television media in particular, uh, and saying, oh, you know, there's nothing to worry about here. Uh, and even if there did, even if there is, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be fine. We don't want to mess up the economy. And all of the different, you know, kind of moving around of the goalposts that they did for many years there, uh, basically trying to keep the issue uh, a politicized, which they, you know, they still have managed to do, uh, and and B in the discussion mode, mm -hmm. you know, and, and debate mode. So it's interesting you talk about those two poles, the, uh, the the politicized, in terms of it being a uh, sort of uh, you know there are two poles here, and we got to look at both sides and right. uh, balance this out because we all need oil and. Uh, and there's also that that uh, that sort of personal side. Good, I, I think of uh, some commercials that they've been uh, putting forward lately, which is uh, the hardworking engineers, the inventors at Exxon Mobil looking for solutions, right. and the yeah. uh, sort of good people, uh, well-intentioned people, and a, a needed action. How do you respond to the uh, the the notion that uh, Exxon is just doing a job that somebody has to do, and that they're really good people who are working very hard to do this uh, this dirty but needed job? Well, I mean, I'm sure that uh, that many of the people uh, at a company the size of Exxon, many of them are good good people. Pardon me. And that many of them are uh, are very hardworking. There's, there's no question about that. And and the company has a reputation for uh, loyalty as well. You know, people who work for that company and that's their entire job for their their career. Rex Tillerson uh, had been there for 40 years. Before heard about he was, him recently? Yeah, we've heard a little bit about him, and you know, maybe we can get back to to Rex uh, in a minute. But um, you know the uh, the the thing about that that sort of polar uh, or, or divided or politicized issue that I, I really am trying to get at, and I'm trying to get at it in the follow up to out of balance and, and still out of balance, um, is that it, it's become this Republican Democrat issue. Climate change is a science issue, period, but it's become tremendously politicized which is really a tragedy. Uh, it, and that has played a major role in inaction, particularly in this country, which is you know, the leader, and we should be the leader on, on trying to address this issue. Uh, but now instead what we have is uh, uh, a denier uh, in the White House uh, who is trying to pull us out of the Paris Accord. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, so uh, I don't see things going in the right direction at this point, uh, but uh, you know we we have to keep on uh, keeping on and, and trying to you know get more people to acknowledge that there's a problem here that we can do something about. And uh, you know there, there have been some things it, we definitely see more uh, renewable energy use and cleaner energy use. But you, you mentioned the, the more recent Exxon Mobil commercials, and you know that to me is uh, it, it's pure greenwashing. And you know the solutions that they're talking about, if you really look at those commercials and think about what they're showing and what they're saying, the solutions that they're talking about and referring to kind of vaguely aren't solutions to the climate change problem. They're solutions to the ever increasing uh, desire that people have for energy and specifically carbon, you know, still carbon burning energy. And so uh, it's great that they supposedly have started to look into things like, you know, maybe uh, uh, algae or something like that and, you know, using that to make fuel, which would be burned. But unless they're also working on some sort of a, a filter that's going to filter out all of the greenhouse gases when that algae fuel is burned, they're still going to be contributing to the issue of climate change, 
which is going to carry on into the future as it is right now. Um, you know, if we, if we stopped using fossil fuels entirely tomorrow, uh, we would still be feeling the effects increasing uh, of climate change for the next hundred years or so, from what I understand from the real scientists of the world. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, um, that you, uh, and I've been seeing some, uh, some of the work you've been shooting on still out of balance. So yeah. uh, why still out of balance? Well, I mean, it's it's sort of uh, uh, you know making. And the what is still out of balance, or what what specifically is the film project still out of balance? Sure. And uh, then culturally, what's still out of balance? Yeah. Um, well, so it's it's a it's a direct follow up to out of balance, and you know out of balance, but it's got a little bit of a different sort of tagline or, or pitch line um, in the sense that if Out of Balance, which was made in 2006 and, re and released in early 2007, you know, that was um, ExxonMobil and fossil fuel companies in, in general uh, are, are funding the, the, the sort of lies coming out in the media about the supposed non-reality of, of climate change. Uh, and which has kept it, the issue in debate mode for way too long. Um, and climate change is real. Uh, the first, first line of narration in the, in the film is global warming is real. Um, you know, now I don't think that there's, there's much use for, I mean, the, there's a certain uh, resonance to that still, just because there are still a number of skeptics or deniers. But the focus or, or the, the tagline for still out of balance would, would be something along the lines of um, uh, what we need, the, the issue of climate change and the, the lack of action on it is a stark reminder that we need to uh, change our corporate accountability laws uh, and, and then enforce them because these various companies, with ExxonMobil again being a, a leader, uh, have thus far anyway gotten away with uh, uh, you know funding of lies to the public uh, about their uh, uh, knowledge, you know, firsthand knowledge from their own scientists of uh, of the reality of uh, human-induced climate change. <clears throat> um, and so that's actually. That story of uh, uh, a couple of former Exxon scientists who worked with them in the 1970s, uh, doing carbon studies and and uh, you know, greenhouse gas emission studies, and, and telling upper brass at Exxon that uh, you know, there's there's going to be some problems here because we're we're like forcing human activity and burning of the of our products and other fossil fuels is forcing all of this, uh, these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And they could see, uh, because they were, you know, scientists and, uh, and understood what was happening and what was going to happen, uh, that it was going to create a problem and it was going to change the climate uh, and in some ways in very adverse ways. And so, you know, that kind of was the inspiration to finally get around to uh, doing a follow-up to Out of Balance and... Uh, taking a look at uh, where that had gone, where that issue had gone, where ExxonMobil had gone since then. Um, and in fact, discovering that there, there is some uh, litigation, you know, basically climate change litigation already taking place at all levels. Uh, you know, plaintiffs who are suing um, state governments, city governments, uh, and uh, perhaps at some point uh, the federal government um, will be suing these companies for their role in, uh, in A, you know, uh, polluting to the extent that we have climate change, uh, but more importantly, you know, what they're really getting at or, or the, the sort of um, legal thing that they're going after is uh, misinforming people, purposely misinforming people uh, about the effects of, uh, of those greenhouse gases uh, going into the atmosphere. Well, um, I know I'm looking forward to seeing how Still Out of Balance develops. What's the uh, time frame for when you think it might be uh, 
uh, when you might start bringing it around to people? Well, um, you know, that's still a little bit up in the air uh, because right now the the latest cut uh, comes in at about three hours. And, you know, it's, I think we're in an age um, you were referring to, uh, you know, vlogs and, and YouTube channels and things like that. Uh, and with the uh, explosion of uh, video on various social media, you know, I think uh, shorter pieces are, are probably um, the, the more desired kind of uh, productions nowadays. But with that in mind, you know, it, it's possible that I could wind up doing some sort of shorter things with some of the clips from the interviews. Well, one uh, of the things that we've talked about, certainly it's something that's uh, related to this, this operation, some city, is the idea that, yes, we are uh, dealing with uh, shorter attention spans and people wanting things to be delivered in, in crisper, uh, succinct messages. But there's that, that counterposing uh, thing that's been, that's been going on, which is, uh, which is sort of mainstreaming our, uh, our interest level or finding our, uh, you know, sort of finding our interest level and really going into that. I think of, of uh, I mentioned when in our interview last week, uh, Minecraft and, you know, whatever it might be, something where we can go into much longer form. And, and as I was reviewing your, uh, your early edit, was thinking of this idea that, that those people who really are, are uh, might be uh, interested in this, might be interested in getting many more of those details. And uh, so I'm, th I'm thinking that maybe there's a media where we need to do a little bit of both or maybe do yeah. both, both the short form as well as the much longer form. Right. And I, I'm definitely open to that idea. You know, I would want to polish and refine um, what's there right now. And if it happens to, if I really feel strongly that, you know, when it's still at two hours or, or whatever uh, length, if I feel as though that's that's as uh, short as it's going to get for that particular type of production, then uh, I'll I'll put it out there, mm -hmm. and I may just go immediately to something like YouTube or or whatever with it. But uh, I always want to explore the avenues of where it could go uh, in other uh, venues of different types. Um, to try to get it out there in front of people. And I do still enjoy doing the, the grassroots stuff as well. Well, uh, um, something that I, I, I thought we could uh, finish up on, uh, talking about that, that grassroots or uh, that democratic aspect of this medium, um, and that is your teaching. Uh, you mentioned that you are uh, teaching over at the University of New Hampshire. Right. What do you, what do you teach over there? Uh, I'm in the communication department and... Um, couple of documentary related uh, classes and one of them is uh, a writing intensive course so that's more focused on looking at the history of the development of the genre um, and looking at a number of the classic documentaries from the past uh, and we even mentioned a couple of them uh, earlier in the, the interview. Kid Cut Follies. <clears throat> Kid Cut Follies, uh, Outfoxed this semester anyway is, uh, is in there. Um, and, you know, all the way from the very early stuff like uh, Nanook of the North. Uh, Great. And Man with a Movie Camera. Great. Uh, very early uh, documentaries. Which, very contemporary feel, Man with a Movie Camera. Oh, uh, absolutely. I love showing yeah. that to my students and, and talking about, uh, you know, um, just the many different techniques that are, that are used there that have really uh, something we can marvel over today. Totally. Uh, and, you know, that... What, what makes that film one of the cornerstone documentary films, I think anyway, is that the filmmaker Vertov really ushers in a very, very artistic angle uh, onto documentary filmmaking. You know, uh, the Flaherty- The birth of MTV. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Uh, Flaherty, uh, who, who made uh, or who directed uh, Nanook of the North, is much more along the, the sort of ethnographic, you know, tradition. He's kind of like a reporter who goes up to uh, uh, the, the great white north and, uh, and films these uh, uh, Inuits and uh, what, they, what they live like, uh, you know, now uh, or now in 1922. Uh, but one of the inter interesting little factoids is that he also gets, gets a group of them to do some things 
in a more traditional old style way that they don't really use anymore like walrus hunting for example um, by 1922 when he was shooting the film uh, he actually uh, he has them go out with like spears and, and that sort of thing when in fact by that point uh, they would have used a, a shotgun uh, <laughs> you know to, mm-hmm. to, to kill a walrus that had come on shore um, so there's a little bit of uh, historical fiction uh, mixed in there, right from well, the hand right from the, the very get go, right from the foundational documentaries. So you saw stuff like that. Um, but Vertov, you know, like like we were saying, and man with a movie camera is uh, he's really a, an artist at work, and uh, in addition to a craftsman, and uh, you know, really so, amazing stuff. So those are your film appreciation or. or uh uh, not film appreciation, but but the, the history, the uh, the criticism, yeah. uh, and uh, any, anything else going on? Well, this this semester uh, we had the maiden voyage of a uh, uh, short documentary um, production class, and uh, that has had some interesting results. And I'll just mention one. Uh, in particular, one of uh, one of my students uh, who uh, may yet be on this uh, on this interview show We'd right love here that. Uh, at some point, um, happened to have a connection with a guy named Ed Joyce who passed away last year. Uh, but Ed, uh, basically, he was involved in uh, uh, a number of different types of post production uh, work, and that included. Um, what we now commonly refer to as the Ken Burns effect, which is that that sort of slow motion in on a photograph or some sort of inanimate thing, uh, and uh, worked with Ken Burns for years on several of uh, of Ken's projects, as well as uh, you know did uh, that sort of post production and other t- uh, other types of things, uh, titles and and that sort of thing, back in the age when that kind of work took hours and hours and hours to do you know this was way before you know nowadays you you, you can do it in a in a second uh with the you just the use software. the ken burns uh <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah yeah on on final cut uh, pro it's it's is actually called the ken burns effect um but uh, ed joyce had been working with that and other things uh, for for many years and uh, we even managed to, uh, to get her over to uh, Florentine Films in Walpole, New Hampshire to interview Ken Burns because Ken, uh, Ken really liked Ed Joyce uh, a, a lot, respected him greatly as, uh, as a filmmaker uh, and uh, you know, his post-production work, but also liked him personally. And so you know, uh, I think uh, the, the real... Uh, opening of the door to that interview uh, for, for that student uh, came from Ed Joyce himself uh, more than anyone else. But uh, yeah, so I mean, it's, uh, it's been an interesting uh, journey this semester and uh, you know, we're on tap to do it again in the fall. So uh, we, we may or may not wind up uh, you know, getting students interviews with, uh, with famous people uh, <laughs> ever again who knows <laughs> you, know. You, you just don't know in, in that situation in the sort of teaching realm uh, yep. how that will work out or if but anybody... you have that model that it's, right. it's possible so, there yeah. it is it, it was kind of yeah uh, kind of uh, a good thing to have happen right out of the gate like that so that's great yeah. well thanks for uh, thanks for for coming in and we'll get you uh, you're going to be doing uh another interview for uh the creators that's the soon. other thing that's the other thing that i'm doing that i'm very excited about is uh you know you and i will be alternating and uh, uh bringing in some other creators here to the show and uh i'm really looking forward to interviewing a number of area artists and creators of other types well that uh you know there's a lot of talk about the importance of the uh the creative economy uh, and as we you know, this this town, Summersworth, um, had a huge industrial mill background, and now uh, there are people who are sort of building on that. Certainly, there's you know we've seen it in Lawrence and Lowell, uh, using Manchester, using these these great buildings for various purposes, uh, not only 
light industry, but but lots of the uh, lots of things in the in the intellectual fields where uh, your assets are not a a piece of cloth, but uh, but a, a documentary maybe yeah. or an app. Um, so looking forward to seeing what develops of that. Looking to, forward to see who you. Uh, grab by the collar and ask questions on <laughs> yeah i'm looking forward to that too and actually you know uh just uh, while we're on the subject of uh, of future things um Steve i've Green. also been kind of preparing in different ways for uh i don't know whether to call it a vlog or or uh, uh, my own sort of uh, perhaps weekly sort of show uh, which uh, has the working title of uh, A House Divided mm. and uh, is focusing on the now many issues uh, where this, this country or the citizens of this country are really, really more divided than I've, I've ever certainly uh, witnessed on my own. And, uh, you know, looking at, at how, how can we uh, hopefully bring things back to a place where something like civil discourse uh, can actually uh, become a little more possible again, uh, because we certainly have uh, been able to do that in the past. Uh, but I think right now, given the division uh, in a in a house divided, it's uh, it's a lot more difficult. It's never an easy thing, you know. Civil discourse is a difficult process, but uh, uh, on so many issues, even climate change, you know, there's just this tremendous division where each side doesn't even want to hear from each other, you know, because they just simply do not believe what the other one is saying. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, to borrow uh, one of uh, Barack Obama's favorite phrases, uh, we're, we're better than that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you got a house here to come to and to uh, cool. to unify. I'm totally excited about it. A community about that's, uh, that city. needs this. Yeah, some city is, is a great thing and I'm uh, uh, really excited about the, the possibilities for, uh, for this place, Bill. So thank you for starting it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Tom. And uh, thanks for uh, sharing your, your, your creative background. All right. And we'll catch you next Pleasure. time. Bye-bye. Uh, smash up the likes, as they say. <laughs> <laughs>